Good morning. I am Pastor Peter Christ, and it's my privilege to welcome you to this memorial worship service and celebration of life for Terence Fredheim. Your presence today is further witness to the reach of God's work in and through Terry throughout his life. It's a remarkable honor to have been asked by Terry and Faith and their family to preside over this worship service in partnership with my friend and colleague, Pastor Michelle Sevig. I hope that our combined presence today serves as a representative for the tens of thousands of pastors, deacons, scholars, church leaders, and faithful laity around the globe that have been formed and inspired by Terry's teachings, his writings, and his witness. I am confident that the respect I hold for Terry, my appreciation for our friendship, and the grief I feel is not unique, but shared with all of you. Muted. Press all tape. It is most fitting that this service is being conducted simultaneously in two primary locations this morning, one here in St. Paul and the other in Chicago. This is how Terry and Faith have spent much of their life living out their callings, one foot in Minnesota and the other in Illinois. I am here in the Chapel of the Incarnation at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, while Pastor Michelle is with Terry's family at Holy Trinity hey. Lutheran Church in Chicago. Some of you are joining us on Zoom this morning, while others are viewing this stream on our chapel worship feed. For those gathered on Zoom, know that there will be a time of visitation following the conclusion of this service, and you are invited to hang on following the postlude. In the meantime, you are welcome to it. use the chat feature to record your presence, as this will serve as one of our virtual guest books for today. For those who are watching this service live on the Seminary Chapel's Facebook page, you are invited to record your presence and leave a message or remembrance for the family in the comments of Terry's obituary posted on the seminary website. Look for the link on the Facebook page. A few notes about this service before we begin. The photos that are featured on screen throughout are all images from Terry and Faith's life and journeys shared. Look for the notations in the corners of the screen. 
As we were gathering today, a slideshow created by the family was shared. This will be included in the recorded version that will be available for you to watch again, should you desire. Finally, a word of thanks to the Luther Seminary community, and in particular to seminary pastor Jenny Grangard, our musicians, Mary Preuss and Tom Witt, sacristan Jamie Gertz, President Robin Steinke, and the support uh, and technical staff who have been working behind the scenes to create this opportunity for us to gather together this day. Now it says mute. I don't want now, mute. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all consolation, who comforts us in all our sorrows so that we can comfort others in their sorrows with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. Before we begin with the Thanksgiving for baptism, I would like to remind everybody who is on Zoom to keep no, yourself muted so that we do not hear your conversations. Thank you. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized in his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a new life, for if we have been united with him in a resurrection like his, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us from the dust of the earth, who by your breath gave us life, we glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life, we praise you. I don't know if Paul we is praise saying you. anything or not. I Holy Spirit, author and giver of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and everlasting hope, we worship you. We worship you. To you, O blessed Trinity, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. God, the sculptor of the mountain,
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our brother, Terence Erling Fretheim. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we may live in confidence and hope until, by your call, we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all your saints, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I knew Terry Fredheim for over 50 years. The uh, Fredheims and the Sponheims had quite a few contacts over those years. When Nell and I were at Cambridge, England, uh, in sabbatical study, uh, Terry and Faith were up at Oxford, and we visited from place to place. We did some teaching together out at Holden Village a few, few weeks, and the four of us were active members of the SEM-related book group that's been meeting for over 50 years. I've been invited to uh, say something about team teaching with Terry, and I'm happy to do that. I'm honored to do that. Terry and I offered a course called God, Evil, and Suffering, or short form, God, the God course. Now this course, these team taught courses, did satisfy a seminary curriculum requirement, but they had to be anchored or rooted in a particular department. And our course was rooted in the biblical department. Terry was the host, I was the guest. So on a typical two hour segment of the week, Terry would take the first hour and I would take the second. It seemed right to do that. We had agreed that in our course, the Norman Normans, the Norman Norm, would be the biblical witness. Last summer, Fortress Press published Terry's last book. I hate that phrase, last book, don't you? Anyway, the title of the book is God So Enters Into Relationship That... Dot, dot, dot. Now there's the category of relationship so central in Terry's thought the relationship between the creator and the creatures, uh, the, all the relationships among the creatures themselves. In uh, 1984, Terry published a breakout book, uh, The Suffering of God. My copy's pretty beat up. Anyway, uh, that's part of the dot, dot, dot uh, God actually suffers the world. God takes the world into God's self. And in that book, The Suffering of God, Terry offers distinctions that would gladden a systematician's heart. God suffers because of us. God suffers with us. God suffers for us. And the relevant biblical passages are, are right there. Now, a classical theist might arise and object. What about the impassibility of God? Is not God transcendent? Surely a transcendent God cannot suffer. Terry would explain to this patient person that actually God's transcendence is precisely in God's relationship. God is so unconditionally for us that we come to understand that God is qualitatively different from us. Now, does all this talk of suffering and relationship, does it start to sound like something called process theology? We know that's bad. Well, Terry uh, was a, a exponent of a biblical theology. He liked to speak of that as a biblical theology. He did not claim the phrase 
Though I have had students tell me that the person that explained process theology to them best was Terry Fredheim. You know, his suffering of God theme would tie in beautifully with a Lutheran theology of the cross. Could there be a process, Lutheran, biblical understanding of the cross? Well, that's a topic for another time. But as a person who uh, offered a, an elective in process thought, I was deeply indebted to Terry because he made so clear the intrinsic internal relatedness of life in God's will. Now, what was it like to teach with Terry? Uh, actually, he instantiated his theology. He lived it. You know, you consider the, the range of his biblical referencing or the depth of his biblical interpretation. It seemed like he lived in the scripture. You know, we are not here to divinize uh, anybody. And I expect that uh, on Sunday mornings, uh, Terry was well qualified to uh, join in on the confession of sins. But he did live his theology. The word became newly flesh in him. I, uh, I remember so much how he spoke of a giving God, and he was a giving man. He gave himself to the course. He was fully prepared to read uh, three major papers, comment extensively in handwriting, uh, and that would be for 60 students each term. Uh, he gave himself to his students. He knew his students. He cared for his students. If you have any questions about that, uh, take a look at the uh, Fredheim entries in the Caring Bridge site. Uh, there is testimony after testimony to the fact that he cared and loved and made a difference, huge difference for his students. He also knew the world that his students inhabited. And so the world's issues, climate change, for example, were important to him because he, know they, he knew they mattered to God. Did we ever disagree? Sure, but not much, and not about the main categories in the course. I remember one spring in a precept, we were discussing the topic of the, the absolute future, the new life, the life beyond this life. Uh, I had brilliantly developed the category non posa peccari. In that life, we will be not able to sin, non posa peccari. Uh, you know, uh, we, we move through freedom, beyond freedom. What's so grand about freedom? We move beyond it, non posa peccari. Well, Terry wasn't so sure about that. He would ask, in a genuine relationship, is that possible if one of the parties of the relationship has no freedom? Uh, he wanted more continuity. He liked Luther's idea that on the earth's last day, you plant a tree. And he would say to me, I know I'll see you in the library. Well, uh, those topics, the ult ultimate future, they're beyond us. And Terry liked to point to the beyond uh, in its many ramifications. He, uh, he would say, the more you come to know about God, the more you realize how much you do not know. To know is to know how little you know. Terry's passing is a huge loss for the church, the seminary, the academy, and the world. But may, maybe there's a, a gain in the process, too. He loved to quote the book of Revelation, that there's a new heaven and a new earth ahead. And there we are told God will wipe away every tear and there, death will be no more, and mourning, and crying, and pain will be no more, for these things have passed away. 
So that's how things stand for Terry, and we have his legacy. century ago, when we first moved to St. Paul to begin my teaching career at Luther Seminary, we were offered seminary housing that was directly across the street from the Fretheims. A serendipitous arrangement. We quickly became not just neighbors, but also friends. We went to church together, our kids played together, they went to school together. Sometimes Terry and I walked to work together. On one occasion, when Terry was away, leaving Faith to fend for herself, he probably took a weekend off to write a book or two, Faith showed up at our door in a panic because a squirrel had come down through the chimney and was running rampant throughout their house. You don't want rampant squirrels in your house. Goodbye to heritage, heritage crockery. Though I remember the event, well, I can't remember actually how we got rid of the squirrel. But obviously Faith and the girls survived the adventure. Later, when I was no longer able to attend church, Terry and Faith unfailingly asked Barbara about my well-being. As Old Testament colleagues, Terry was the Jeremiah guy and I was the Isaiah guy. Once, we quibbled about which was the longer book. I argued chapters, Isaiah's 66 over Jeremiah's 54. Terry argued words, Jeremiah's 42,654 over Isaiah's 37,036. Were, were, were we in today's political environment, I may, may well have demanded a recount. Terry won, of course, but I got the last laugh. Terry admitted that Isaiah 43.4, Isaiah, was his first, was it, with its unique emphasis on God's intimate relationship with us, with us, was perhaps his favorite biblical passage. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. The only place in the Bible where, where, where we hear that sweet, three-word three valentine from God, I love you. Terry was skeptical of a monochromatic God. God was altogether more interesting than that. As he wrote in a Word and World article and later repeated in a sermon, no eight-color bo eight box of crayon would suffice to depict the color of God. Terry needed at least a larger box of 64. Similarly, in his unforgettable, unforgettable Pringles sermon, Terry wondered aloud why anyone would want potato chips that one, one after another were identical, or why anyone would be satisfied with only one image of God. For Terry, the Bible's multiple images, images of God were, were essential 
to describe the character and person of God, and they provided much of the basis of, for his theological perspective. Terry was especially interested in female Im images, images of God, and I was quick to remind him that there are more of these in Isaiah than in any other book. For Terry, it was like fingernails on a chalkboard to hear immortal, invisible, God-only wise, unresting, unhasting, and silent as light. And perhaps worst of all, we wither and perish, but not changeth thee. As Terry wrote, the portrayal of God as supernatural, self-sufficient, omnipotent, omniscient, infinite, incorporeal, invisible, impassable, unchangeable, immovable, immutable, transcendent, was simply inaccessible to our modern world. And it was, of course, inimical to the, to the suffering of God, so important to Terry's theological understanding. Terry was reluctant, was no doubt correct, but still I was reluctant to let go of the hymn, if only because of its wonderful Welsh folk to melody that makes it such a joy to sing. I have always thought of Cap Terry as colleague and friend, but he also served as my mentor. An example of all of these qualities is a story that I have never told until now. Unlike most of my colleagues, I was called to the seminary with a yet unfinished doctoral degree. The primary issue was an unfinished dissertation. After several years of teaching, I was given leave to get back to it. As encouragement and support, Terry made the incredible offer of reading through major sections of the in-process in process dissertation chapter by chapter to make suggestions and offer critique. Who in the world would do this? Well, in this case, Terry. Though Terry was reserved, he was clearly not without emotion. He loved his family, of course, but he also loved his students. And for me, there was a certain smile, hard to describe but unmistakable, that I will sorely miss, just as I will miss Terry Frehan. a retired faculty member of Luther Seminary. Terry was my most important teacher and a very fine colleague. In addition, I was baptized by Terry's father. It's an honor to read Walter Brueggemann's memoriam to Terry Fredheim. Amid my sense of loss over Terry's death, I'm glad to be able to remember him in his well-lived life. I continue to remember Terry as a major force in Old Testament studies who helped move our discipline away from arid criticism and toward more generative theological interpretation. I count him as among the half dozen or so scholars whose influence will persist in shaping our ongoing work. Terry's early book, The Suffering of God, that I had the privilege to edit, brought him into the company of Abraham Heschel and Jürgen Moltmann who together probed most deeply the pathos of God. I've long thought that his best scholarly piece was his brief article in the Journal of Biblical Literature on the Egyptian plagues. In that article, he saw the plagues as disruptions of creation and Pharaoh as a creation disruptor, and thus as a harbinger of the destructive agents who would eventually provoke our climate crisis. 
it's the habit of the Society of Biblical Literature that as scholars become more senior, they do less and less work in the society. Unlike that, Terry, into his old age, always showed up. He not only showed up, but he regularly read another paper. He never engaged in polemics, as was usual in the society, but carved out his own space. We were regularly able to witness his own delight as he teased out yet another fresh element in the text. I will continue to remember Terry as a dear friend, as my best, most trusted, and long-running professional friend. I recently dedicated a book to him and four other colleagues whom I mark as my reference points and support system. Terry and I have in common that we are both preacher's kids and we share deep rootage in the best traditions of German pietism. We've had a long running and unresolved tussle concerning the agency of God in the Old Testament. I thought maybe he gave away too much in his move toward process theology. He thought I had too strong a sense of God's governance, largely due, he judged, to the pernicious influence of John Calvin. He readily told me that a greater dose of Luther would help me get my mind right. What I shall most remember about Terry was his unfailing generosity and his ironic spirit as he encouraged me and so many others in our work. In earlier days, I came to Luther Seminary frequently, and he was always a welcoming presence for me with attentive hospitality. I always looked forward to meeting him at the Society of Biblical Literature most often for free food at the Fortress Press reception. In later years, that meeting was greatly enhanced by faith's presence along with him. Before I finish, I want to say this. I have long thought that because of Terry and his like-spirited colleagues, Luther Seminary in my day was the best, the most faithful, and the most effective of all of our seminaries. On a good day, I dared to imagine that my own school, Columbia Seminary, was second after Luther. Terry was a generative force in his well-lived life. His scholarship produced a compelling and durable corpus. He was a master teacher who knew how to engage and respect his students. But most of all, he was a consummate human being, a man of deep faith, who put his scholarship into the service of faith. No one could doubt his love of and trust in the God of the gospel, to whom we now entrust him with gratitude, hope, and confidence. Walter Brueggemann. This wide world we shall always find those who are crying with no peace of mind. And when we have them, or when we feed them, we belong to God. We belong. in Terry's 41 days in the hospital. He needed a document of some sort, so he told me it was one of his desk drawers. Now, Terry had many gifts. Neat, organized desk drawers was not one of those gifts. As I was looking for the document, I found two copies of a writing from the Oxford Book of Prayer. When I asked him about them, he said he often read that prayer to his seminary classes. The more I have read it, the more certain I am that this is what was going on in his heart and mind as he lay in the hospital bed in our living room. I read it to you now. Written by Teilhard de Chardon. When the signs of age begin to mark my body, and still more when they touch my mind, when the ill that is to diminish me or carry me off strikes from without or is born within me, when the painful moment comes in which I suddenly awaken to the fact 
that I am ill or growing old, and above all, at that last moment when I feel I'm losing hold of myself and am absolutely passive within the hands of the great unknown forces that have formed me. In all those dark moments, O oh God, grant that I may understand it is you who are painfully parting the fibers of my being in order to penetrate to the very marrow of my substance and bear me away within yourself. Amen. Creation has been a career-long passion of Dad's. His very first book was the study of Genesis 1 through 11. I have chosen Genesis 1 verses 20 to 25 to share. I have chosen this because I have heard him teach about all the creatures many times. Genesis chapter 1 verses 20 through 25. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and living creatures that move of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of their kind cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth according of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God so enters into relationship that God will be present with God's creatures at all times and in all places. This reading seems at first like it might be a common choice for a funeral reading, but that's not why I selected it. My dad used to tell me this at bedtime from as far back as I can remember. Before long, we recited it together. For me, the imagery is intertwined with a little girl walking on a path holding her dad's hand. In the past weeks, I add to it the memory of my family's last communion together and Pastor Sevig anointing her foreheads with frankincense oil. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Teach us to number our days.
surprise us with your love at daybreak. Then we'll rejoice and be glad all the day long. Even in the midst of deepest dread and pain, make us glad for as many days as we have suffered. Teach us to number our days. May wisdom live in our hearts. Teach us to number our days. May wisdom live in our hearts. Let your servants see what you are best at. The ways you rule and bless your children. And may the graciousness of God be upon us and prosper now the work of our hands. Teach us to number our days. May wisdom live in our hearts. Teach us to reading from the prophet Isaiah. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight, and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. Just a few weeks ago, I received a surprise Facebook message from Faith Fretheim asking me to call her, which she never does. So when I spoke with her, she told me that Terry was entering hospice care and I asked if I would bring communion to their family. Of course, I said. I was a former hospice chaplain. This was solid territory for me, and I was honored to be asked. What was not familiar, however, was pastoring to my own mentor, professor, and well-known biblical scholar. So I fretted. What scripture does one read to a scripture scholar at a time like this? I phoned a friend from seminary and begged her to help me, and she suggested Isaiah 43. Great one, I thought. I've got that one in my ELW book, my pastoral care book, that I, my go-to book whenever I have a pastoral care call. So once we were at their home and we settled in for communion, I told Dr. Frechtheim, I'm a little nervous to read scripture to an old professor of mine. And everyone chuckled a little bit. And I asked, what would you like to read, hoping that I'd be off the hook for picking something? Let me see your Bible he said, reaching out his hand toward my ELW book. Oops, first mistake, I don't have one. And so I said, I was planning to read Isaiah 43. Would that be okay? Immediately he responded, why? Everyone else laughed. I froze. <laughs> and then his daughter said, he's always and forever a teacher. 
Now, we did read Isaiah 43 that day, and I managed to say something about why to Dr. Fretheim, feeling a little bit like I was in my final oral exam. But little did I know how important this brief text is to him in his lifetime of work. Soon after word of his death spread across the internet, a 2013 video came up on Isaiah that began to go sort of viral in the Lutheran world anyway. And in it, we hear Terry's quiet, authoritative, wise voice teach us that this is the only place in the whole Bible where God says directly, I love you. In the video, Terry explains why this passage is so powerful. He says, God values who you are. God honors your place in relationship. And God places confidence in you to speak and act and pray in ways that God can use. For you are God's own vineyard, God's own garden of imagination, God's very own beloved. God says, I love you. And it's clearly expressed in Isaiah 43, but not only there, as Terry would teach us over and over again. God's love for all creation is expressed throughout the Bible. As he famously said to his students, there's plenty of gospel in the Old Testament too. Referring to us preachers who only seem to use the New Testament text in the lectionary cycle. Terry believed with every fiber of his being that the God we worship is a God of relationship. God is not some separate deity far off and beyond our own experience. The God of all creation, the one made known to us in Jesus Christ, the one who empowers our lives in every way through the Holy Spirit, is the one who makes themselves known through relationship. And due to our limited understanding of God, we use metaphors to understand and appreciate our relationship with God most fully. Before he died, Terry gave me a signed copy of his most recent book, God So Enters Into Relationship That. And it is a treasured gift that I've been devouring in these last few weeks. In it, he writes about the meaning of the gift of relationships, not only with God, but with each other and with the whole creation. Terry writes, a key word for any significant discussion about God of the Bible is relationship. Indeed, the category of relationship is central to Israel's theological reflection about God. He invites us to think about relationships we've had with others, the best relationships. What makes the relationship good? What makes it genuine? What makes it the kind of relationship in and through which God would empower you to live and work? God's love is made known through human relational metaphors, which are ordinary, common, everyday, and earthly. And as Terry would point out, sometimes, oftentimes, they are female-centered. Terry believed deeply and taught consistently that God is with us in the midst of our suffering, knowing fully the pain and trauma that we experience as human beings and the joy that is found in undeserved love. He taught about the God he believed in, the one who entered so deeply into human relationship that God's love was unmeasured, mysterious, and never fully comprehended. God is friend. God is parent. God is sovereign. God is. And you can fill in that blank with so many different metaphors. In these ways and in so many more, God shows love for us and for all of God's creation, whether it's made known through the actual words, I love you, or not. Recently, a meme came across Facebook that made me think of him, and I shared it with his wife and daughters. It said, in academia, we don't say, I love you. We say, I found an article that made me think about you. <laughs> All three of them responded with understanding. One with a blushing emoji and another said, that's totally him. He sent us articles all the time. Terry 
Dr. Fretheim, father, papa, was made known through relationships too. No matter what name you called him, he was a professor and teacher, a husband, partner, a father and grandfather, preacher and pastor. Every relationship he had with other humans was informed and modeled and shaped by the relationship he has with God. His theology about God was not just for his teaching in seminary or for writing books or, quite honestly, not even for the pastoring of God's people. But his core theology about God in relationship with humanity and all creation was at the very center of his life lived in relationship with God, with people, with animals, and with all of creation. Any of us who had the privilege of Dr. Fretheim as a professor and those of us who knew him as friends or family know that relationships were at the very center of who he is and of his faith. So we must look at the most valued relationships to understand and appreciate who Terry is to his family and what his life means to everyone who loved him intimately and to those who knew him professionally. He was a teacher who showered compassion and understanding on those who were preparing for ministry. I can't even tell you how many former students of his used the word compassion to describe him and recalled incidents when no one else understood or supported them in ministry. But Terry took the time, had the patience, and created a safe space for them to consider and answer their call to serve God and the church in new ways. He was an advocate in his own subtle but strong presence. His daughter Andrea remembers going with him when he was called to preach at local congregations on behalf of the seminary. And each time he would begin his sermon by saying, grace and peace to you from God and from Luther Seminary, which is now X percent soprano, emphasizing the growing number of women who were preparing for ministry. Not only did he advocate for women and girls, but he also for the LGBTQ people and others who were not usually celebrated or even welcomed in the ministry. He was, as I like to say, a golden compass, traveling throughout the Old Testament and showing the many directions of the text and the people to give us all a better understanding of God. But did you know that he could also, prior to GPS assistance, look at a map, even in a foreign language, and plan his entire day as a tourist without ever looking at the map again? He could, and he did on several occasions with this family. He was a partner to the fullest sense of the word, not trying to one-up or prove superiority in any sense. When Faith was offered a position in the women of the ELCA in the newly formed ELCA offices in Chicago, he simply said, now it's your turn. Time for your career to come first. And she moved to Chicago and he stayed in St. Paul and their partnership thrived as they each answered the call to their own vocational ministries and relational gifts. He was grandfather, father, known as Papa to his family. They remember not only the scholarly times in classrooms with students, as many of us do, but also the silly, playful times with their Papa, wearing ribbons on his head at gift openings at Christmas time, getting his nails painted with Hello Kitty emblems, completing completing complicated puzzles around the dinner table and then leaving the mess there for days only to frustrate faith. Or joyfully receiving their young grandson's rendition of a happy anniversary rap. He absolutely loved being Papa to you three grandchildren and Dad to two brilliant and compassionate daughters and husband to one loving wife for 64 years. Of course, there is no way to name every way that encompasses who Terry was in relationship to others. 
But there's one that I haven't named yet that cannot be forgotten. Child of God. More than a metaphor, an actual naming and claiming as God's own beloved in the waters of baptism. Long ago in a rural Norwegian Lutheran church in Wisconsin, his dad, also a pastor, baptized Terence in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Terry leaned into that beloved relationship his entire life. When he died, his family gathered around his bed and laid a teeny tiny baptismal garment on his chest and recalled the promises that were made that day in 1939. We anointed his body with fragrant oil and commended him to God. We sang, you belong to Christ. In him you have been baptized. Alleluia. And reminded each other of God's promises to be faithful in relationship with us in life and in life the next. Terry, it was good to be in relationship with you. Very good. We give thanks today for the gifts you are to the people who are gathered virtually throughout the world. We celebrate and give thanks for your legacy, encouraging us to celebrate the gifts of God's compassion and creation and teaching us that God remains faithful in relationship with us. Faithful during times of joy and celebration, faithful in times of great suffering, and yes, faithful even in death. I can imagine Terry blessing us now, assuring us that God is present in the midst of our grief, holding us even more tightly, and providing comfort and hope for the days to come. So I invite you now to receive this blessing from Holden Evening Prayer, a beloved evening service from a community that's dear to the Fretheim family. May God, Creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the spirit of love be our guide and path for all of our days. Amen.
show us your vision. Peace among nations, hope for all people, home in your care. Call us, O oh Jesus, you call disciples from the your wisdom by your example shape us in doing all that you say raise us O oh spirit breathing through Jesus singing forgiveness through time and space shape us for new life in resurrection We confess together the Apostles' Creed, a creed that both sustained and guided Terry Fredheim throughout his baptismal vocation, his ministry, and his teaching. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Formed into relationship as the body of Christ, we lift our prayers to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, in holy baptism, you have knit your chosen people together into one communion of saints in the body of Christ. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to share the new life in Christ. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Give courage and faith to all who mourn. Especially today we pray for Faith, Tanya, Andrea, Kelly, Shannon, Emre, Stephen, Tom, Lisa, Amanda, Chris, and Judy. Grant them a sure and certain hope in your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith, that where this world groans in grief and pain, your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your light and life. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Help us in the midst of things we cannot understand to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. God of mercy, Hear our prayer. God of all grace, we give you thanks because by his death, our Savior Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death, and by his resurrection, he opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, 
Let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us commend Terry to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Terry. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Now receive the Lord's blessing, the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good so that you may do God's will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in God's sight. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you, bless you now and forever. Amen. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>